the way I look at it is uh, because we have unique challenges in a, for a financial institution, uh, being that we are monitored by regulatory agencies, um, we think that we've established a fairly good pattern and learned a fair bit through our technology journey. And we're hoping that uh, what we've learned will be helpful to you. Um, if you roll back a few years, and my colleague Darian will go into more detail in this, but a few years ago, uh, we began to understand that in order to remain kept competitive, in order to uh, progress as a company, we really needed to dedicate ourselves to being a technology company. And this involved um, some changes uh, in various parts of the organization, from the technology we used to how we use the technology itself, to how we organize ourselves as creators and users of this technology. If you look at how we approach things like open source, like public cloud, like agile and DevOps methodologies and principles, um, all of this uh, was adopted at a broad scale uh, over the past few years. And we learned a great deal in this process. We learned what is possible. We learned uh, about how to overcome some of the challenges we came across due to the for aforementioned uh, unique challenges that we face. And we've, we've come to the, the position that um, this has been a great growth experience as we go through this uh, cycle of modernization and how we um, have simultaneously delivered great things uh, while establishing these core principles and putting them in place so that we have now a, a culture of collaboration and a culture of ownership. Uh, and we've uh, nurtured that for our engineering team so that they can be innovative, uh, but at the same and sustain that innovation, more importantly, um, but also so that they can, um, while, while building things, they can maintain them over time uh, and be able to manage the risks associated with some of these technologies. Uh, being a financial institution, we, we look at, uh, risk plays a very role, a heavy role in the decisions we make. So we look through at all these stuff through a risk management lens. So in every decision that we make, we're balancing the progress that we'll make versus the, the risk that we have to manage. And in each case, we determined that going forward with these plans, made sense from a risk management standpoint because in putting them forward, we're actually helping to manage risk. Whereas, you know, in some cases, maybe uh, in another uh, situation, someone may make the determination that going forward with these technologies could introduce new risks. But um, while we take that into account, we balance that with the overall risk uh, that we incur and, and how do we establish the guardrails and the process so that we can properly govern uh, all these new initiatives uh, over time. If you look at the, the slide here, we've laid out sort of the, some of the core um, principles that we've established in this technology journey, from modernizing our standards to uh, embracing an open source first mentality, to really going all in and embracing cloud native technologies, uh, to rolling out agile uh, development methodologies uh, across uh, the majority of engineering teams, I would say, really uh, doubling down on the continuous integration, continuous delivery story, um, which we can use to standardize the technologies that are developed and how they're developed and how they're rolled out. And then really focusing on, you know, how this affects human beings. Uh, how does our technology affect the customers, both internally at Capital One and externally? Uh, and then finally, we have to get it ready for uh, an artificial intelligence world and making sure that we have ways to embed the uh, machine learning technologies that uh, we're all using to compete. And then finally, balancing that against the, the cyber risk. So speaking of risk management, I wanted to walk through, uh, take a step back and, and look at risk management from a couple of different angles, because when it comes to embracing open source technologies and open source methodologies, there are some things to, uh, to take into account. Uh, so I, I have here on the screen a, um, a study from Gartner, all about um, software composition analysis and scanning and the role of scanning. But more than that, and this is something I like to talk about a lot, is viewing the software supply chain in its totality and how, it, um, how the provenance of the, the source code we use uh, affects how we govern its usage uh, inside you know, uh, Capital One, but also governs how we, um, how we think about pushing uh, our contributions back out upstream 
into these open source communities, which I'll, I'll touch on that in a bit more detail later. But, but first and foremost, how do we look at the totality of the software ecosystem that we depend on? And how do we you know, mitigate the risks uh, by hardening that supply chain and making sure that it's reliable uh, and that we can depend on it to sustain our innovation going forward? Um, this, is, this plays a very large role in, in, in how we um, manage risk for our technology rollouts. Along the same lines, um, Forrester also came out with a report uh, focusing on cloud container adoption in the enterprise, but you could really look at the, um, uh, the takeaways from this report and apply it to, frankly, any new technology that's being adopted uh, on a massive scale across the industry. In this case, cloud computing, I'm sorry, uh, container adoption, but it could apply to, uh, uh, to anything really. But the, the finding here is that compliance is the number one concern among senior tech leaders using container management platforms. You could insert a lot of different technologies in that place, maybe Kubernetes, well, container management, uh, or some other uh, technology platform. Um, but the key here is when managing risk, it's all about how do we adopt the technologies that are gonna sustain our productivity uh, while making sure that we comply with the various regulatory bodies that, that monitor us um, and also making sure that you know, we manage the, the licensing, the open source licensing in a, uh, in a, in a way that uh, makes sense for our developers and users. Uh, and how do we make sure that you know, the guardrails that we've established can be uh, monitored without getting in the way of our developers? How do we uh, create a system that allows our developers to do their jobs uh, without us interfering? And further to that point, if you look at the real impact of say open source of DevOps and agile and you know, cloud first um, principles, you can see a very real impact um, across the enterprise. This is a 2019 survey from the Linux Foundation, uh, the, the uh, uh, wonderful hosts of today's uh, session. Uh, but in this, in this survey that was released in September of 2019, you can see that the organizations that adopt open source methodologies and, op and an open source approach uh, they're the ones that deploy the most often. They're the ones that, you know, use the most open source code. There is a, a tangible uh, relationship there that I think uh, speaks to the flexibility that's allowed by mass adoption of open source software. And then we come to, you know, I spoke a couple minutes ago about how we view software usage and governance through a, uh, a risk management lens. And to help us with that view, uh, I often like to refer to the supply chain funnel, which uh, helps us ascertain where a particular product is in its development life cycle. Um, but it also, when you're looking at this funnel, uh, it also implies uh, an ease with which um, it can be bi-directional so that no matter where you are in the funnel, you're always taking in feedback and contributing back to uh, the source of the, the software that you use. When you, when you look at the supply chain funnel, think of most of the upstream uh, open source technologies that we, that we use uh, in, in building our software. Uh, think of those in the top layer. Those are the, the core development libraries, the core platforms that we develop on. Uh, think of all the, the JavaScript, Node.js pieces that, you know, most uh, enterprises use on a, on a daily basis. Um, all of that is, consists of essentially raw parts. And as we move down the funnel, uh, these raw parts coalesce until at the very end we have a released product. And by looking at it, at the, at, um, the software development process through this diagram, uh, we're able to, uh, first of all, make sure that we've got the processes in place by which we can uh, sustain the development of these upstream communities. Uh, but also see how it links to our overall product development so that we're linking our open source usage and methodologies directly to the value chain so that there's a clear link, we can demonstrate a clear link between um, our adoption of open source uh, and the increase of value of, of what we deliver. Um, one thing I really like to point out every time I talk about the supply chain funnel is the, this mid-tier. Uh, it has interesting properties in its own right. Uh, because this is the stage where the raw parts that you initially bring in, you know, they first start to coalesce around a relatively mature platform, not a polished product per se, but a 
relatively stable and mature platform that attracts developers. This is where you uh, build out your developer ecosystems as well as maybe get your uh, first early adopters. Uh, and uh, I, I love the, the unique properties of this layer and I can, uh, I can talk uh, separately just about that middle layer uh, if anybody wants to hear me uh, in another session. But, but overall, you know, Capital One, just like a lot of different large enterprises, perhaps 80 to 90% of the software that we develop uh, comes from open source sources. And so by looking at it uh, in this way, it helps us to uh, understand the provenance of the software that we use so that we make sure to think about the sustainable development of each parts of this funnel. Uh, making sure that the top tier, the top of the funnel is sustainable is every bit as important as making sure that the, the bottom tier, the release product is also sustainably developed. So this is, um, this is key to, to our thinking. So as part of um, undertaking this journey of modernization of our uh, technology, both and, and modernization of technology takes the form of both the technology uh, platforms that we use, as well as the way we put together technology and the way we um, uh, put together organizations to, to ensure this culture of collaboration. Uh, the open source program office uh, was started some five years ago to help ensure that, that we have the, the processes and people in place to, to make sure that we're doing the right thing. And so this comprises five different um, channels or, uh, or columns. So beginning with usage, how we use the software we take in and going back to the supply chain funnel would be like uh, the pieces of software that, that fill out that, that top layer. Um, how do we bring that in? How do we ingest it and push it into our um, development uh, 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 processes? Uh, how do we make sure that we're using the best versions? How do we make sure that um, we've identified and remediated uh, you know, significant vulnerabilities? Uh, how do we make sure that the license management is um, according to, you know, is in compliance? Um, all of these things we, we look at when we're, uh, when we're bringing in new software for our developers. And the second piece of that is the contribution. And this is where I talk about, and this is where I, um, in the previous diagram, I alluded to the bi-directional nature of the, of the funnel. And in this case, it's, we help to mitigate risk by making sure that the contribution process is streamlined such that developers can take the changes they make uh, and push them back upstream because we don't wanna be maintaining technical debt over time. Uh, and this, having an, a streamlined contribution process helps us to, to manage our technical debt more sustainably. Uh, so it doesn't uh, increase dramatically over time. We can kind of keep it at um, a base level. And then finally, sponsorship. Uh, sponsorship is a word we use to describe uh, when we release open source software projects. Um, how do we launch open source communities? Again, this is key because for the software we develop, and when you think about it from a, um, a, a, a a, a technical debt perspective and how you manage that. Uh, and when you think about it from a um, making sure that the software is robust uh, and delivers according to you know, what we'd like, uh, the visibility that it attains by being available in open source communities uh, is, is highly valuable because now uh, we have many third parties who will uh, determine you know, how well it works. And if it doesn't work as well for them, they will, they will let us know. And we can build that into the process and make sure that not only are we managing risk from a technical debt standpoint, but we're managing risk from a um, robustness of software standpoint. And the, the last two things, uh, this fourth piece, inner source, this is all about the culture of collaboration and ownership that we've worked so hard to build here. Uh, how do we make sure that um, our developers are coalescing around those middle tiers in the supply chain funnel. Um, how do we make sure that the platforms we built are becoming uh, viable standards that support um, the initiatives of developers and users at, at Capital One? And then this fifth one is, this goes back to the sustainability of the communities that we depend on. Uh, how do we make sure that um, the software we depends on will continue to be reliable over time and, and can sustain our innovation internally. And so this is where we invest in uh, communities and foundations like the Linux Foundation, like the Continuous Delivery Foundation, like Finos, the, the CNCF, um, 
the Apache Software Foundation. It's all about making sure that we can continue the symbiotic relationship and rely on, uh, on these core pieces over time. All right, and now I'm gonna turn it over to uh, my colleague, Darian. Uh, Darian, take it away. Thanks, John Mark. As, as John Mark mentioned earlier, uh, there's a there's a whole area, you know, there's there's multiple spaces that we had to go through and, and changes to our culture to enable not just, you know, leveraging open source, but but modernizing our whole technology mindset. Uh, and so I'm going to take you a little bit through the history of that, how we got to where we are, some of the pitfalls that we accounted for, some of the things that we learned along the way. And, and if you take go back to where the, the beginning where we decided we, we need to be a tech company. We need to be, we need to play in this space because uh, that is what is being, you know, th that's where all the competitive uh, realities are, right? For us to really survive and, and lead uh, in the financial space, we recognized we had to change the way that we did business and, and it had to start at, at the base here. And a lot of that came from our acquisition of ING Direct that sort of kicked off the hey, look, you know, technology first seems to make a, a, a real sense there. So as John Mark said, going in all in on Agile was, was one of the, the first pieces there. Uh, and, and building all the way through getting open source, saying that we're going to start dabbling in the cloud, you know, going through containers, committing to the cloud, you know, at building a container platform for the enterprise. You know, that's led us to where we are today, which is, 100% in the public cloud. We have shut down our data centers. Uh, we have no more legacy, uh, leg legacy system operations or anything like that. And to, to understand the scope of that, we have a technology organization that's about 10,000 strong. Uh, and um, having that change from waterfall to agile, educating that, that large group of, of engineers and folks uh, comes at a cost. It, it, it is hard to do. And, and those journeys are, are the ones that are going to be the most challenging for organizations. Open source actually makes some of that easier because there's so much available out there that we can leverage and bring to the, to the table to enable our, our technologies to really help us do our business. Uh, next slide, please. So as we started dabbling in the cloud, you know, we have to recognize we're a highly regulated company, right? We are a financial company. People, people trust us with their, their financial health, with their money, and we are 100% committed to in, ensuring that, that we do the, the right thing for them and, and, and keeping that trust. We also had to make sure that we enabled the, the engineers working in the cloud to understand the cloud, to how do they start operating the cloud in an effective way so that they could get the job done uh, while making sure that we were, we were compliant, making sure that we were safe uh, in doing those things. You know, some of the things we had to do is stand up, uh, we, we built a very comprehensive tech college to, to help educate. We have very large numbers. I think, you know, if this is, we're pretty close to the, the uh, the, having the highest percentage of AWS certified associates next to Amazon itself, uh, because we believe in that education piece and making sure that the, the organization has the knowledge necessary to, to do these things. But we didn't get there overnight, right? Having this, this constant education and constant learning, it was absolutely necessary. And when we started moving into the cloud, Obviously, we can't just do everything all at once. It's a, let's, let's take some of these easier pieces, some of the leaves of the, of the tree there, things that were less dependent upon other pieces that we could move over and do a lift and shift to start out with. Next slide, please. So, some of the, the mentality that we clearly had to adopt pretty early was, has to be automated, we have to have DevOps, we have to enable these teams to operate on their own. So we, we've had this, you build it, you own it mentality. But along with that, of course, comes some of its own issues of duplicating problems, duplicating solutions. We've got 8,500 engineers, 
you know, over a thousand teams, invariably team over here doesn't know what team over there is doing and they need to solve the same thing. Open source was 100% leveraged in almost all of these, but sometimes even leveraging those open source pieces, you can put them together in different ways that duplicate a solution, but in different ways. So there's a lot of um, uh, undifferentiated heavy lifting that occurs uh, when we want to try and minimize that as much as possible. Uh, so next slide, please. Part of the pieces that enabled us to start being a little bit less duplicative in our efforts uh, were some of the, these pieces of software that we recognized we had to have. One was Hygieia, which gave us the ability to view that DevOps pipeline, that CI CD pipeline, uh, very well from, from you know, start to finish and understand where everyone was. Uh, and in 2015, uh, we were able to make that open source and immediately started getting great contributions from a huge part of the, the, the community out there. Uh, as it stands right now, Walmart, I believe, has you know, over 5,000 active uh, Hygieia users, and they use it widely in their organization. For Cloud Custodian, Cloud Custodian is a, is a automated governance and security compliance, uh, as well as some cost optimizations to cloud environments. And we've had great engagement across the industry, Amazon, Microsoft, uh, and we've recently donated it to the CNCF. And th this is 100% behind our, our mission that John Mark you know, leads here. We need to give back. We want to, to generate uh, great software and we want those contributions back from the community because we know that there's brilliant people out there that have great perspective that we can also learn from. Next slide, please. So as we're going through this journey here towards, you know, more recently, let's say within the past couple of years, uh, as we moved most of our workloads into the cloud uh, using more fundamental uh, portions of it, we realized, hey, there's, there's a lot of opportunity here maybe to consolidate workloads, uh, to get a little bit more smaller bite-sized pieces. And so we recognized we, we really had to have a container platform for the enterprise that met our needs from a security standpoint, from a regulation standpoint. And we've, we've, been, we've been building that for us. Forrester recently you know, found 86% of technology leaders plan to use containers for more applications. Um, that is clear, clearly aligns with us. We recognize that it is, it is the path forward for us. Um, we based ours on Kubernetes and um, because we are, again, a regulated entity, we have a lot of unique needs and challenges that we have to solve for. Some of those pieces, some of those fundamental pieces of our container platform, we have open sourced. Uh, CRIT is one of them, E2D is another. Uh, those are available on our open source repos on GitHub right now. And as we look forward, as we move forward and, and build out more, I'm sure more pieces of that will, will come out because we wanna leverage the investment that the community can provide. Uh, next slide. So, you know, in, in closing, there's so much opportunity with open source software for an, enter, an enterprise, even a highly regulated one. Uh, we, from our own experience, our journey of moving into the cloud and becoming this tech first company uh, could not have been made possible without open source. That's yeah, that's a <laughs> that's a very good point. Uh, it, it's it's interesting to look back over the over history and and see how much of the current state of technology as we know today, how much of that would not be possible if not for the initial development of open source platforms um, that's been crucial, uh, as well as the the the, uh, the cloud platforms that are developed co concurrently. Um, the other thing I want to point out is that when we talk about risk, mitigating risk and, and risk management and the software supply chain. Um, it's crucial, it's a vital, of vital importance that you learn how to build the relationships with your risk partners. And it is something I, I like to emphasize a lot, which is, you know, there's a tendency among developers to, uh, uh, to, I guess, 
misunderstand the intent of the auditors and the, the risk managers and, and those folks and, I, and, and legal staff. And I just want to um, mention that those are vital partnerships that should be built in order to, if you want to build and sustain and make this manageable over time, uh, it's, it's crucial to, to bring those people along uh, and make sure that they are your core partners when you move forward with any of this stuff. Um, that's one of the that, that's one of the takeaways I've had from uh, working with uh, in Capital One as well as a variety of other companies. They can help you unlock so much as you move forward, and we couldn't do what we do uh, without their support and input and helping to move this forward. So when you look at things through a risk management lens, um, you know run that by your risk partners and, and make sure that you've established, uh, done the work to establish those relationships. That's and, a great point. Uh, and I think um, that's the, the end of our core content. Uh, I think uh, right now we can open it up to questions. I think there are some. Yes, I, I, I will. Uh, I've got You're some questions. For the questions. Yeah, I'll, I'll be the presenter of questions. Cool. Uh, so first one for you, John Mark, is uh, how has Capital One tackled legal and governance concerns around open source contributions? Excellent question. Um, the first part of that is I'll answer that with by taking on the, the first the first unspoken part, which was there was a long process to make sure that we were governing open source usage first, uh, first and foremost. Um, we had to make sure we had the processes and the infrastructure in place to support what we wanted to do with open source from a usage standpoint. When it came to contributing, uh, you know, one of the things that attracted me to Capital One was, you know, I've been in open source communities for many years and I saw that, uh, you know, it takes some work to get uh, large enterprises to, uh, to be uh, engaged and to be contributing to um, communities. And that's what attracted me to Capital One to, 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 to help uh, uh, streamline that process. Um, and one of the things that you know, I, I found out is that uh, there's, it, 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 speaking of the, the unique challenges that we face in the regular industry, it, we, it, it was basically a question of how do we frame the issue. If you frame the issue as, yeah, yeah we want to stick some things open source, it's because it's fun to do, um, it really has to be about what value does it deliver. Uh, and once you frame it as, hey, there, we need to balance risks by making sure that we're, we're managing our risk of uh, technical debt management, we're ma managing our risks of um, you know, uh, not being visible externally. Um, these are all the things that we have to balance when we're conceiving of our uh, contribution processes. So we made some initial um, headway on this a few years ago, and then over time, uh, we've been able to refine that and streamline the process. And in fact, we are in the process uh, right now of, of further streamlining it uh, and making it uh, more accessible and easy to use for our developers as part of our ongoing, you know, building of the culture of collaboration. That's great. Uh, just as a reminder to anyone listening, if you do have a question, please just click the little QA button. You can you can put it right in there. Um, the next one I'm going to take, uh, what makes a container platform compliant? What regulations does Capital One care about? Uh, so that's a, a, a very good question. And I, I think, you know, when it comes to your companies, it's going to be a, a variable. I'll, from a, a Capital One perspective, the things we care about are, do we have some sort of chain of custody of those containers? Can we guarantee what is being deployed into production is exactly what was you know, committed in code? So we have that, that, um, that, ver that uh, uh, viability and, and, and the ability to verify what that actually is. Um, are the things running in the container platform all from the appropriate place? Have they all been vetted appropriately? Do they have you know, the appropriate permission lockdowns? Do we have them tagged appropriately so that the right teams get called when those containers are not running, running well. Um, the, the composition of the containers themselves, are they as minimal as possible? Do we have as little vectors of attack as possible in there? Are they patched? Are they rehydrated? How long are they, keep, are they running? Uh, do we want a container that sits there and runs for 60 days and, and never, never dies? 
Probably not. Uh, we'd rather probably have something that runs for maybe a maximum of 24 hours, right? And leverage the, cap the capabilities of containers to automatically spin up and spin down and balance across live containers so that even if someone were to compromise a given container, they would only have a short period of time to do any work inside of that container. Um, so, so a lot of those things that we think about, they're not necessarily baked into any platform, right? There's no one tool out there that does all of this for you. A lot of it is open source software that we've, we've had to leverage and software that we've built to help us achieve these pieces so that the developers don't have to think about these things, right? They just know they, they deploy a container and it's gonna be compliant by using this base container and they use the, you know, these, these uh, tools inside of production will automatically handle some things for them. Next question for you, John Mark, is how do you harden the open source supply chain? Is this SDLC simplification? <laughs> how do you harden the open source supply chain? How do you, you how do you, you simplify SDLC? <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, maybe I'll take a pass on that one. But um, but hardening the open source supply chain, I, I can uh, address that. Uh, the open source you harden the open source supply chain by being involved and being present. Um, and this comes back to you know how we view uh, risk. Um, I've seen so many companies uh, that view risk from the standpoint of we're going to take an open source code and we're going to scan it for vulnerabilities and then we're going to remediate that with those and then we're going to use that in our software and we're done. Um, that doesn't harden the supply chain. That is basically uh, foregoing uh, the, the supply chain maintenance to somebody else. Um, whereas if you are involved in the supply chain process and developing it, um, you're going to ensure that it's more robust, more sustainable over time. Um, and by being present and involved, uh, you're helping the communities on which you depend uh, be more reliable and sustainable over time. I, I feel that this yields the best results um, over time um, because what better way to manage vulnerabilities and protect cybersecurity than to prevent vulnerabilities from ever appearing in the first place. Um, this is, this is uh, uh, you know, especially why contributing and being present in these communities is so important. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, okay, next question. I'm going to um, I'm going to answer this first one, and it's it's going to be a quickie, and then I'll just uh, answer a follow up to the containers. Um, so the first question is, how long does it take for a company to become 100% in the cloud? Well, I can share with you my experience with Capital One. I joined uh, almost four years ago to the day. Uh, and when I joined, we were about 8% of our workloads in the cloud. Uh, and we were 100% in the cloud earlier this year. So for us, it was a three and a half-ish year journey. Um, that I think is going to be very dependent upon uh, your individual organization, the commitment you have to that, the buy-in from the very top, because it's not an easy process. It is extremely complex to do. Uh, and there's only really one other major company that we're aware of that's done it, and that, that was Netflix. So um, there's probably others out there, but nothing probably anywhere close to our size in, in revenue or anything like that. Yeah. Um, does that jive with you, John Mark? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And then the, uh, the other piece is, uh, let's see. Oh, okay. The question has changed a little bit. So do you still use you build it, you own it? The answer is yes, and we've just shifted that a little bit, right? So now the platform itself has responsibilities for certain things, but as a, developing, as a development team, you're still responsible for the construction uh, of your you know, container or your, your Lambda or whatever it is, as well as being responsible for operating it and making sure that the metrics are set up correctly, the scaling is set up correctly, the on-call rotation is all there, so. Yeah, it's it's core. <laughs> we, yeah. uh, our teams uh, embrace that. Uh, it's it's a it's a core part of who we are. Absolutely. All right. Question for you, John Mark. What is your strategy for joining or contributing to open source foundations? That is a terrific question because it changes over time, um, and it really depends on linking uh, the software used to the value that's delivered. Um, taking a look at what software do you depend on 
what communities do you depend on, uh, how is it used internally, and then we use that to determine, you know, which, which foundations does it make the most sense to support financially. Um, a lot of this comes down to which uh, foundations, which communities are our um, developers already involved in. Um, so we take input from a variety of sources uh, from our developers, uh, but ultimately it comes down to how do we, again, do through a, viewing through a risk management lens, how do we ensure that we are best able to uh, sustain our innovation internally and using that to determine and, and basically ranking which foundations are the most important to us and which ones do we participate in. So that's, uh, that's definitely the, the approach we take. But it, again, it shifts. Technology changes over time, new foundations pop up over time. Um, you know, we have several different teams that uh, will we'll, we'll take on new technologies uh, that we have to be kept up to date with. So it's, it's, uh, it, it, it evolves, um, but we're always looking to see, you know, where should we be um, putting, placing our bets? Yeah, I, I can only imagine, and I'm nowhere near as plugged in as you are to the whole ecosystem. I mean, there, there, there are probably, what, dozens of different foundations out there that you have to keep a pulse on? Yeah, you can't throw a rock without hitting three different foundations. <laughs> so it's, yes, it's uh, a. <laughs> there, there are a number of there are there's no shortage of communities to invest your time and money, and that's why you have to be. Uh, that's why you have to link it back to the value that you deliver and make sure that you know it makes sense when you're putting your resources into uh, various communities and foundations. Um, ultimately, you know. You're 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 going to need to to be able to to back up your claim that um, investing in these is important. And what better way to do that than to show you know the, the usage patterns internally, and and what you know which ones are the most important to you? Yeah. All right. Next question. I, I think this is one that maybe we can both tag team on. Um, understanding that company specific software creation will not be open sourced and that technology-based capabilities can be open sourced. Where does Capital One draw the line on open sourcing when it is industry specific, i.e. regulation-based capabilities? That's, that's, ooh, that's an interesting question. You know, it's, I would say it's early days yet, but um, I would say that there, uh, there could be an opportunity to partner up, speaking of our open source foundations, um, we are involved in the Finos uh, foundation, which is comprised mostly of financial institutions. And I know that's certainly an area that uh, they care about. And I look forward to uh, continuing that conversation. I think it's going to be more important over time. Uh, that, yeah, that jives with me. And, and, you know, I think maybe a little bit more when I think about it, you know, we, we, we open source cloud custodian, right? And that is the way we ensure compliance. And yet, we're not necessarily giving away the secret sauce as to what those policies specifically are on, on how we, we, we secure things, mostly because our environment is going to be different than all of yours out there, right? We, we have, you know, hundreds of, of different AWS accounts and, and GCP and Azure and things like that. And how we've structured them has evolved over time and it may not be the same as yours. So those policies may not be appropriate for your environment. And I would, I would think that, you know, we never want to give away the secret sauce, which is our, our secret sauce is banking, right? We, we, it's financial. Uh, so those pieces of software, we will probably never open source, but the, all the things around it on how we operate, um, there, there's probably a, a quite a bit more that is available than, than we have yet to open source. Thank you for bringing that back to Cloud Custodian because yes, <laughs> the, <laughs> core, the core technology pieces, the core platforms, we feel that they're uh, general enough and we feel that we face the same problems as several other enterprises, that those are the ones that are um, most viable. Uh, and, and to um, Darian's point, you know, uh, chances are the, um, the specific policies, that the, the content that we use on top of these platforms is frankly not um, useful to the vast majority of people, but the, the core platforms and getting those in a place where they are more robust and, and ready um, to serve uh, general purposes, you know, that's, that's where uh, it makes sense to invest most of our time. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I've got one more for you, John Mark, and then I think we're going to wrap. Um, 
what is the biggest challenge as Capital One sees it around enterprise developers contributing to open source communities? The biggest challenge. Um, that's a that 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 question could be um, addressed over uh, <laughs> days, weeks, months. Um, you know, <laughs> it's <laughs> sorry. Go ahead. No, it's 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 a. Uh, I mean, that's that that's that's part of the. I mean, that's a that's an evolving answer too. Um, just because uh, th this most significant challenges change over time. Um, you know, initially, maybe if you scroll back uh, a few years ago, uh, the biggest challenge was making sure that you know we had that we knew uh, who was contributing what and that we could um, uh, and that we could manage that uh, a little better um, and that was really that was really down to you know how do how do engineers know the best way to contribute software at this point i would say that the the biggest challenge is how how do we facilitate the relationships between our developers and uh, the upstream communities to which they contribute so that we can pave the way for more streamlined processes. Um, every community has its own standard for contribution um, and engineers have to spend a lot of time coming up to speed on what each of those are. And so I feel that part of our job as an open source program office is to help them you know, learn those skills and learn how to pivot between communities as needed. That's probably the, the biggest challenge. It's really not technical in nature, it's really um, community-based. I, I, I would, 100% agree with you. And, and I was thinking in my head, you know, when it comes down to it fundamentally, and from my experience and, and seeing my teams, it's, it's time, right? It's, it's what time do they have right. Right, where they can contribute and they can, they can take the time to go through and, and, and engage with those communities, you know, do the PRs, making sure that, you know, the code we, we, you know, commit is go through the appropriate process, make sure we're not, you know, exfiltrating any data and all this type of stuff and yeah the, the fact of the matter is you don't need a majority of your engineers contributing upstream to communities all the time uh, to make it sustainable you really only need uh some group uh core group that 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 does uh that does this on a regular basis um it, frankly and to your point it, it all comes down to time and time management and making sure that people are focusing where they need to be uh, and that's probably the, the biggest challenge is making sure that you've got a clear, you know, uh, guideline for, for who's contributing and when uh, and how. Yeah, I think that's great. Cool. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much, Darian and John Mark. We really appreciate today's presentation and your thoroughness with the questions. Um, I'd like to wrap us up and just thank everybody for joining us and hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks everyone. It was Bye. a lot of fun. Thank you. It was fun. Bye-bye.